when people bring up the best- No, we're not doing that again. Hey, it's been a hot minute since I talked about a FNAF fan game. How about we do that again, huh? Previously, we've talked about Tykin Sons Lumber Company and Ultra Custom Night. Both of these games have relatively small followings though. Today, I want to talk about something a little more well-known for once. You know, to shake things up a bit. And hey, hey, you can put down your pitchforks. I know the title and thumbnail probably sound like an incredibly nuclear take, but, uh, guys, I gotta tell you something. You've all been baited. I'm not talking about Five Nights at Candy's 3. I'm talking about Five Nights at Candy's 1, Five Nights at Candy's 2, Five Nights at Candy's 3, and Five Nights at Candy's Remastered. What? Are you saying all these games are bad? How dare you? No, I don't hate any of these games. Okay, never mind. I think it's important to clarify right away that overrated doesn't mean bad or awful. There are things I really love about these games, but would I call any of them my favorite FNAF fan games? Probably not. And that's okay. I think it's worth taking a look at things from a critical angle from time to time. And I really haven't done that much on this channel. So I'm sorry if you love one or all of these games, but today I'm gonna talk about each one and why I'm just not a huge fan of this wildly popular fan game series. So strap in guys and gals, because this is going to be a long one. Hey, maybe even grab a snack or something too while you're at it. You could probably eat a whole bag of potato chips while watching this and nobody will judge you. But first, this video is sponsored by Genshin Impact. Genshin Impact is an open world action RPG game available on PC, Android, iOS, and PlayStation 4 and 5. Step into the vast magical world now and start your adventure on the continent of Teyvat, where seven kinds of elemental powers surge. Genshin Impact now releases the new version 2.7 update and all travelers playing the game get new challenges and missions to complete. Join the journey with already existing travelers and reveal mysteries of the land of Teyvat. The new 2.7 update for Genshin Impact adds brand new characters such as Kuki Shinobu and Yelan. Alongside these new characters, new events are being added to the game. These include a perilous trail, a muddy bizarre adventure, and many more. That's not all. A music contest will be hosted with the The Almighty Arataki Great and Glorious Drum Along Festival event during the 2.7 update. Don't forget to participate, submit your work on social media, and win the reward. Thank you to Genshin Impact for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel. Use my link at the top of the description or in the pinned comment to download Genshin Impact today. Hey, uh, is it getting hot in here, or is it just me? Five Nights at Candy's is a series of FNAF fan games created by Emil Mako, someone who I've been following on and off for years, mostly just because of how notable the Candy series is. Starting off as a simple fan character, all it took was for some crusty ass dude making a fake FNAF 3 fan game that featured candy for Emil to go, hey, I could probably just make a game myself with this character so losers stop stealing my work. Yeah, that's a good idea. And so only a few months later in July of 2015, Five Nights at Candy's was released. Now it would be very easy for me to rip into this game. Trust me, I have a lot of issues with it. But because of how early this game came out in the fan game scene, it would be a little unfair to criticize it that heavily. For the time this game came out, it was honestly a breath of fresh air for FNAF fan games. It was one of the first to ever feel like a genuine product of some kind, something that could be sold alongside the other FNAF games with few people batting an eye. Of course, now we have the fanverse. So whenever a candies collection drops, this hypothetical statement will become a reality. But for now, we have to focus on the humble beginnings of this series. This time, instead of working at a pizzeria, we take control of a night guard working at a burgers and fries joint. Even if you ignore all the dialogue and text, you'd still be able to probably figure that out thanks to this little burger on the office desk that takes the place of the cupcake. Speaking of the office, yeesh, I know this game is old, so I won't give it that much crap, but the click team cylinder effect thing when you move the office is really bad here. It was easily one of the most distracting things I noticed when playing the game again for this video. While we're already talking about the office, even with this game essentially just being FNAF 1, there's a couple things here to shake up the gameplay. No lights on the doors this time around. Instead, we are just left with the ability to close them. Unlike FNAF 1, however, this time we are given cameras right outside the doors, which is cool because it gives a fairly good reason to use the cameras there. However, here's where one of my first issues with this game comes into play. When the majority of the animatronics are at the door, their eyes will shine through the darkness, letting you know they're there. I'm not really sure what the thought process here was, but all this ends up doing is making the game incredibly easy. What about Old Candy, you're probably wondering? Okay, so like the name implies, Old Candy is an older version of the Candy animatronic that has been deactivated. His main gimmick is that since he's an older model, he does not have lights in his eyes, so you actually have to check the cameras to see if he's at the door. Here's the thing though, this shouldn't even be a gimmick for one character. Technically two, but we'll get back to that later. For the sake of making the game even remotely challenging, every character should not have an obvious tell when they're at the door. 
the eyes lighting up in the doorway ruin certain camera scenes as well. One of the characters in the game, the penguin, is very short. So when he's at the door, it's really hard to see him on the camera. This is super cool to me, as you have to actively look out and make sure he's not hiding. You see, that's what I would say if his eyes didn't light up when he was at the door. This completely ruins the intent of the camera and him hiding, and once again, just makes anything revolving the doors in this game a complete joke. On the topic of doors, power in this game is way too forgiving. I rarely felt like I was struggling to preserve my power at any point during the course of my playthrough. I would often get to 5am with an absurd amount of power left and just shut all the doors and sit there for the rest of the night. This takes me to the main gimmick of the cameras in this game. Every camera is pitch black, but you can double click a camera to activate night vision mode to light up the rooms. This is a really neat idea, but once again, even when I used the night vision a lot, I barely felt like I was even using a lot of power. I ended up having the night vision on most of the game, and double clicking on the cameras every time just became second nature. There are some cool visual things done with this concept, but all the effort goes to waste when you really only need to keep track of three cameras. This is a trap that a lot of FNAF fan games fall into. And hell, even actual FNAF games fall into this trap. I adore FNAF 2 for everything it brought to the franchise, but the actual gameplay of 2 is extremely shallow once you know how to play it. The two cameras by the doors are important to keep track of Old Candy and later Rat, but the third camera I speak of is the final new addition to the core gameplay in Candies. In front of you is a third door, or ticket booth, that you can close. This door is protected by glass that is broken by an animatronic who resides at the top of the map. Their name is Blank, and they take on the Foxy position in this game. Think of Blank like FNAF 1 Foxy, but instead of using one of the existing doors, they get their own brand new door just for them. You have to check on Blank to make sure they're still in the room. If Blank leaves the room, you have to shut the ticket door to protect yourself and make them go back. Blank is a fine addition to the gameplay, and once again acts as another reason to check the cameras besides the two next to the doors. Speaking of the animatronics, a small nitpick I have with this game is just how linear the animatronics are. For example, Candy and Cindy both start on the stage and make their way to your office. Once they make it over to the doors and you successfully stop them, they immediately teleport back to the show stage. One of the coolest aspects about FNAF 1 is that the animatronics weren't linear like that. Freddy and Foxy were, but they both had good reasons to be. Chica and Bonnie, however, would typically never return to the show stage after they had been stopped. They would always linger around a bit and to cameras that were closer to the door. This sometimes resulted in really stressful situations where Bonnie and Chica would come back to the door really quick and make you waste a bunch of power. Candies absolutely could have benefited from a system like this for the AI. Since the power is such a joke in this game, having the animatronics be more aggressive with their movement patterns may have been a way to solve that issue. Even if the game has a ton of flaws, one thing that is consistently good in this game is the visual design. Having the time be part of the UI is really smart and works great, and the environments and models are incredibly well done. Besides the fact that FNAC was one of the first fan games made with a lot of effort, the character design alone of Candy is so strong that I definitely would not be shocked if it was a major reason for the series' popularity. Even if I think these games are kind of overrated on the whole, I still can't deny how well done this aspect is handled. Speaking of, I think now would be an appropriate time to talk about each of the animatronics, since besides gameplay, I have a lot of positive things to say about these characters. Candy and Cindy, while being recolors of each other, are incredibly strong designs that have obviously held the test of time. I will 100% be buying that Funko Candy plush when it drops. You can count on that. Blank is by far my favorite character design from this game. The details on the model look fantastic, and it's fun seeing all the little drawings all over him. His animation when he hits the glass is also very charming. Chester is probably the weakest design of the group, but he's still alright. I think more could have been done with the concept of him being a chimp, since chimps are known to be a little aggressive and crazy, and that could have been represented in his stills on the camera or something, but other than that, he's fine. The Penguin, while being a very simple design, is easily one of the best in my opinion. I love his little suit, and the fact that he's much smaller compared to the rest of the cast. And like I mentioned earlier, I like him being hard to see on the doorway camera. Now I had to go to the Candy's wiki to find out what the Penguin's unique mechanic is, because I knew he did something different when he got into the office, but never once slipped up and let him in. You know, maybe I would have if it wasn't for those damn glowing eyes. Anyway, apparently the Penguin messes with the doors if he gets into the office potentially messing up the player if an animatronic is at the door and it can't be closed. Which is pretty cool, I guess, but like I said, I never got to experience it firsthand. Old Candy is alright. It's a pretty creepy looking design, but I never really think much of them. And once again, I really don't like that their gimmick is just their eyes don't shine at the door, because that makes the rest of the gameplay piss easy by default. The Rat is a bonus animatronic that appears on Night 6. Gameplay-wise, he's my favorite aspect of the game, because it actually makes the game somewhat challenging. The Rat pretty much works the exact same way as Old Candy, meaning that his eyes are not visible in the darkness. He can appear at either of the doors, and you have to be very quick to shut the door on him. He will jam your button very fast if you let him stand there for too long. Every time I play FNAF 1, 
I always die at least once on Night 6. So I think it's a decent challenge for a game that is extremely easy up until that point. Finally, we have Vinny. Vinny is a recolor of the puppet, but he doesn't appear during actual gameplay. Instead, he shows up in these FNAF 2 style after night cutscenes. These cutscenes are fine. I really don't have much to say regarding them, but they're kind of neat to look at and a nice bonus for completing a night. One final big point I want to bring up for this game are the jump scares. None of them are very scary or interesting in my opinion. And Blank specifically has such a comically bad jump scare that isn't helped by the fact that there's a huge gap between Blank hitting the glass to when the jump scare actually plays, which pretty much removes all tension immediately. That pretty much wraps up Five Nights at Candy's 1. There's a couple other tidbits such as Phone Guy being kinda meh, minus the latte scene, that's an absolute gem. You have two new messages. Hey, how's it going? Oh, sorry, I have a latte here. But other than that, there's not much left to say. It's a simple old fan game that hasn't aged the best in some places, while also leaving a pretty strong impact on fan games to come in the future. Like I said, I don't hate this game, but it's a very middle of the road gameplay experience that's carried by nostalgia and great character design. If only there was a remake of this game that fixed some of these issues while improving the visuals of the game, hmm. Five Nights at Candy's Remastered is the most recent game to come out of this series. It's exactly what the name implies, a complete rebuild of the game that changes mostly visuals, but adds a couple new things as well. One of the biggest things added in my opinion, other than the obvious massive improvement to the visuals, is the inclusion of widescreen. Thank God. FNAF 2, 3, and 4 setting a standard of 4x3 instead of widescreen always bothered me, especially after the first game was already widescreen. I still to this day do not understand the thought process here. All it does is give the games less space to work with, which makes the mobile versions look like stretched out garbage. Anyway, I don't have much to say about this one, but there's a couple key points I want to bring up. First off, there are essentially little to no gameplay changes here, which is a bit of a bummer. Sure, this is the definitive way to play this game, no doubt, but all the issues I brought up already apply here as well. The game is too easy, the power's a joke, you only need to use three of the cameras, etc. Second, while some of the animatronics do look significantly better here, Blank and the rat kind of look worse? I think the darker shading on the original game benefited the designs of those characters a lot, and Blank specifically looks far too bright now. He's supposed to be worn and damaged, but Bro is looking as shiny as a whiteboard. The jump scares are slightly better, but still not amazing being real. Other than that though, the changes are few and far between. There are some interesting YouTuber easter eggs. an insanely good extras menu, and even an extra game mode added. Shadow Candy Knight, also known as Null Knight, is an extra knight that changes up the gameplay a lot. This is a 1v1 fight between the player and Shadow Candy, who has a great looking model by the way. Shadow Candy resides in the new Cam 13, and will sit there until he teleports away. Once Shadow Candy teleports away, it's your job to check every camera to see where he's at. Once you find him, he'll teleport back to Cam 13, and you keep doing that until the night is over. The coolest part of this gameplay mode to me is the fantastic use of the night vision mode on the cameras. As stated earlier, the night vision on the cameras in the game feels almost pointless in a way, but here they're used to the fullest. Not only will Shadow Candy hide on every camera in the building, he could also be hiding in the night's off version of every camera as well, meaning that you have to check both versions of every single camera. Something like this during the main gameplay would do wonders with some tweaking, having not only an actual reason to use the cameras, but a great reason to actually keep the cameras dark as well. If you can't find Shadow Candy in time and he gets in your office, two things happen. One, if you close the correct door on him, he will hide again, but drain a bunch of power in the process. Two, Shadow Candy will get in your room and jump scare you. You don't die, however, but instead, Shadow Candy will set you back an hour on the clock and freeze your time. The only way to restore it back to normal is to find the origami cat on the cameras and click on it. Null Knight is a fantastic addition that serves as a great challenge in a pretty easy game, and is easily my favorite part of this remaster. Everything else though, pretty much same thoughts and feelings. I'm glad this game exists, but I do wish more was done with the idea to improve some core aspects of the gameplay. Five Nights at Candy's 2. I hate this game. Listen, I'll be charitable to every other game in this series, but 2 is by far the worst, and playing it for the first time recently has genuinely been one of the most mind-numbing experiences so far this year. I always avoided playing this game in the past, just from looking at footage, I knew I would dislike it, but I played it. Oh boy, did I play it. This time around, you play as some teenager who has recently lost a bet with his friend. The punishment? Spend five nights in an abandoned warehouse. 
So yes, we are moving away from the interesting and fun look of the original Candy's location and moving over to a boring, bleak warehouse. This location alone already brings up my first problem with the game. The environments here are genuinely not fun to look at, and they're not really creepy either. Every camera here blends together to me, and the dull-ass grey colour palette used here is dreadfully boring. The gameplay loop this time around involves these telephones that are connected to each camera on the map. If you ring a telephone, a nearby animatronic will be lured to that location and attempt to disable it. Seems fine enough, right? That's where you're wrong. For starters, you can ring any telephone on the map regardless if you're actually looking at the camera or not. This means that you could technically never switch cameras once if you just end up getting lucky spamming random phones. Is this efficient? Probably not. But it shouldn't even be a possibility to begin with. This then ties into my next point. The fact that for this entire game, you never have to put the camera down. That's right. Most FNAF fan games have the issue of barely having a reason to use the cameras, well this one has an opposite problem, that being that you can just look at the camera the entire game and still win nights just fine. Nothing of importance even happens in the hallway, it only serves to let you know when an animatronic is no longer on the cameras, which you can figure out just fine by noticing they're nowhere to be found. So the whole game ends up boiling down to putting the camera up, clicking on telephones, hearing them ring the whole night pretty much, and spamming random cameras until you find something to do. It's so goddamn boring. This hurts even more, knowing a very obvious fix to this camera issue would be to, oh, I don't know, have an animatronic that you need to flash when they're in the main hallway to make them go away? You're given a flash for the main hall, but all it ends up really being used for is either nothing because you're looking at the cameras the whole night, or just to check real quick who is off the cams. There's a couple other animatronics that work differently that I think are important to bring up. Chester will attempt to get to you by using the vents around the warehouse. If he starts messing with the vent, you have a limited amount of time to ring the phone connected to the camera he is on. Once you ring the phone, he'll run away from the vent. But that's the thing. Even if his gameplay gimmick is slightly different, it still really just boils down to ringing the phone that he's closest to, just like every other character. Except for the penguin, who has a pretty good gimmick actually. He has a random chance to spawn in a camera, and if you take too long to switch, he'll crash your system and make you restart the camera. Simple, but effective. I dig it. One of the most obvious downgrades in this game compared to the first one is the designs of the animatronics. This was easily one of the strongest aspects of Candy's 1, so it disappoints me to say that this game really drops the ball here. All of these wither designs look awful in my opinion, and don't do a good job of looking scary or even cool. These are about on par with fan-made withered animatronic edits you'd find on DeviantArt in 2016. I only hold these to such a high standard because I know Emil could have done a lot more with this concept. I mean, take a look at the withered animatronics from FNAF 2 versus the original ones from FNAF 1. Each of these designs is phenomenal in my opinion, and does a great job of making the wear and tear look unique and cool. Here it's just so lazy and uninspired that it almost hurts. Blank especially I think could have gotten a really, really good withered design but he looks so bleh in my opinion. I will say though, I do like the look of Withered Penguin. It's about on par with the others quality wise, but something about it really clicks with me. Maybe it's the eyes. This game also includes some 8-bit minigames, which are fine. None of them really stand out to me looking back on them now, and I kind of forgot they even existed, except for the one where Candy gets arrested by the police. I could never forget that gem. Night 6 is another rat night, just like the first game, Although this time another animatronic, Cat, is also here. These guys pretty much just act as a hard mode since they combine multiple aspects of the other animatronics into one. Cat will attempt to crawl into the vents like Chester, and Rat can crash your cameras like the Penguin. At the end of the day though, you're still playing Candies too, so there's only so much fun you can have. I don't really know what the main opinion on this game is nowadays, but even Emil himself admits that it was not up to his standards, so that's gotta mean something, right? If you can somehow enjoy this game, more power to ya. Heaven knows I enjoy some games that people probably think are terrible. But from my point of view, this is easily the worst game in the entire series. I would much rather have a safe, easy FNAF 1 clone with tweaks over ringing phones in a boring warehouse for six nights. Thankfully though, the next game in the trilogy is a much needed improvement over this installment. However, it doesn't come without flaws of its own. Five Nights at Candy's 3 is probably my favorite game out of this whole series, and is actually the sole reason I wanted to do this video originally. My video on Tykin Sons, the most underrated FNAF fan game, was always planned to have a part 2, which is this video you're watching right now. I wanted to do it sooner, but I also didn't want people to think I was specifically milking the whole overrated underrated thing. So I let some time pass and now we're here. Now let me be clear, I like this game and I can see the potential it has and what it really does well. But as much as I want to love this game, I don't think I ever can. 
After two separate playthroughs, I always find myself complaining about the same shit every single time. Which sucks, because this style of FNAF gameplay is easily my favorite. FNAF 4 is my favorite FNAF game, gameplay-wise, because of how fun it is juggling everything at once. And the same thing goes to the night segments in Tyken Sons Lumber Company. So why don't I love this game just as much as I love those other games I mentioned? Honestly, it all comes down to the core gameplay loop. Graphics are really nice looking. Monster Rat is genuinely one of the best FNAF designs I've ever seen in anything ever, with Monster Cat and Monster Vinny not too far behind. The minigames look great with some awesome looking pixel art. Sure, the hide and seek minigame gets a bit repetitive after a while, but it really just serves to make the final minigame hit all the harder. The before night minigames are also really cool, and I enjoy exploring the area. But if you don't care about some of the extra stuff, there's really no reason to ever check these parts past night one. Maybe if there were some hidden power-ups of some kind for the night gameplay you could find here, it would serve more of a purpose for the average player, but for what it's made for, it gets the job done. So, the game looks great. It has ridiculously good character design, the minigames are neat, so what is wrong with the core gameplay that makes me dislike it so much? Okay, so this is how the gameplay works. You play as Mary, who has to fight off nightmares in her sleep. These nightmares include Monster Rat and Monster Cat, who both do something completely different. The game starts off with just Monster Rat, so we'll talk about him first. Monster Rat can spawn in one of three different locations in the bedroom. These include a door and two different closets. If he appears in one of these places, you can catch him with your flashlight, and he will go back into hiding and the cycle continues. If you mess up and take too long, Monster Rat will enter the room leading to Phase 2. In Phase 2, you must shine your light at Monster Rat's face in order to fight him off. Monster Rat will move his head around, so you need to stay alert in order to have the light hit his head. Once you successfully fight him off, you enter Phase 3. This is where you have to look under the bed, where Monster Rat will be hiding. When you see him under the bed, you have to go back up and face the opposite direction to where he is. Finally is Phase 4. Here, you wait to hear a sound from Monster Rat coming out of the bed, or some light breathing. Once you hear one of these two things, you can move to the other side of the room and hit Monster Rat with a final beam of light, which will send him back into hiding. That sounds cool, right? And you'd be correct, it actually is. At least, it is for the first couple times. But then you have to do it over, and over, and over, and over, and then you realize this is the entire game. The gameplay loop very quickly boils down to moving back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth around the room the entire night waiting for something to happen. Then, once the rat gets in, you do the thing, fend him off, rinse repeat the whole game. What about Monster Cat, you may be wondering? Does he add to the gameplay in any meaningful way? No, not really. From Night 3 onwards, Monster Cat will appear in the nights alongside Monster Rat. Monster Cat will either appear on the left or right side of the room and slowly crawl up. How do you fend him off? By shining a light at him. Well, here's the issue with that. What do you do for pretty much the entire night during this game? Shine your light back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. What does the cat do? Appear on either side of the room and get repelled by the light. Essentially, Monster Cat is almost never a threat, and adds very little to the overall gameplay loop that makes it even remotely more interesting. Which pretty much means, even with a new character in the mix, you're doing the exact same thing all five nights, but it just gets slightly harder each time. In both of my playthroughs, I never once died to Monster Cat, even at points where I feel like I should have. You see, the only point that Monster Cat is actually a threat is when you're busy dealing with Monster Rat, which I will admit, creates a sense of panic knowing that you have to deal with both at once. However, even with the idea of panic being there, Monster Cat was never aggressive enough that it mattered. If Monster Cat was slightly more aggressive, I probably would have fairly lost at a couple moments during my playthrough, but it never happened. There is one final thing about the Knights that I have to bring up, that being the cassette player. The cassette player is an interesting gimmick to say the least. At the start of the night, you push play on the player to start some music. When that music ends, you rewind the tape. What does this do, you may ask? Well, it speeds up the night. Without the cassette player playing the music, the nights are extremely long. I like this idea on paper, but it always kind of just felt like a thing to do rather than a super meaningful gameplay mechanic. Playing and rewinding the tape only takes a little bit of time, and that time away from searching for the rat or fending off the cat never ever felt detrimental. Also, I don't know where else I'll get to mention this, but the room in this game is full of a bunch of very odd YouTuber references that feel a little too in your face. Hey, even Smike made it in. There are so many little things that could have been done to make this gameplay loop here slightly more interesting. I'm no game designer, but things such as having Monster Cat be able to appear under the bed or behind you with a cassette player would give some more use to those areas in the room. Monster Cat not showing up on the sides for a while? Check under the bed or behind you to see if he's there to fend him off. Giving the rat different movement patterns would also help keep things fresh, but I guess this was already kind of done in the form of Vinny. Night 6 consists of fighting Monster Vinny, 
who is essentially a significantly harder version of Monster Rat. He has a different movement pattern and runs around the room, making him a pain in the ass to fight. I'ma keep it real with y'all, I tried, but I could not beat this for the life of me. My mouse movements were always too slow, and I could rarely get past a full cycle with him once. However, during this fight, I ended up accidentally finding a way to completely break the game and skip nights. This isn't something I discovered, but I did find it naturally during gameplay with no outside help. Essentially, all you have to do is point your flashlight at the far right of the room, where no doors or closets are visible. For some reason, if you just wait there the entire night, nothing happens, and you can just sit there and win. Wonderful. This game has so much cool shit going for it, but at the end of the day, the core gameplay loop is too lacking to carry an entire game, and would probably fit better as a segment in a larger sister location style game. I don't love it like many people do, but I can see the potential there. Is FNAF 3 truly the most overrated FNAF fan game? Well, for me personally, it's definitely up there, but I can understand why people like it. There's a whole bunch of extra minigame stuff I've neglected to bring up here, as I don't think it's really relevant to this video. But if you enjoy the game for that aspect more than the core gameplay, more power to ya. Well, with that out of the way, I'm pretty much done here. Even with everything I've had to say about the Candy series in this video, I am excited to see what Candies 4 brings to the table. I've been uh yeah, and now I'm hungry, so I'm gonna go eat a burger and fries. See ya!